I'm really excited to be here and talk to you all about something that I've been passionate about my whole life, and that's what is intelligence? Um, I look forward to discussing with you all at some point, um, you know, uh, private discussions. What, what is your own conceptualization of intelligence? Um, as early as I can remember, I've been fascinated with this question because I was placed in special education as I was a, when I was a kid. I had an auditory learning disability. And I remember sitting there in the classroom and wondering to myself as I saw all my, my friends and sort of the expectations that the teachers had for our future, just wondering, you know, there's just so much more p potential and possibility that I see in all my classmates. And then I would look at the kids in the gifted and talented programs as well. I was not in gifted and talented programs, but I would look at them and I felt like they weren't getting their maximum possibilities either. And then I'd look at everyone in kind of who weren't in special in, in any way, you know, by the school system and but well, they're not winning either. So just as a young kid, I just, I remember thinking to myself, wow, nobody's winning. Nobody's winning in this education system. And by winning, I mean, um, we're not getting the best out of, any, about, out of any of these kids. So I published this book in 2013 called Ungifted where I talked about the science of human potential, the science of intelligence, as well as my own personal stories. Um, yeah, and this was a picture of me as a little kid um, when I was still in the cartoon world before I moved over to the human world. Sorry, it's a bad joke, but when I was really young um, and, uh, and just, just wondering these kinds of questions of what is intelligence, what is human possibility, what are we capable of achieving in life? Um, so I would like to make a distinction today. I've uh, never made this distinction in public before in quite this way, so I'm really excited to kind of um, to test this out on you all. But I really like to make a distinction between small i intelligence and big i intelligence. So I think we've done a really good job of measuring small i intelligence. So for the last hundred years, psychologists have studied something called the G factor or the general factor of human intelligence. And you can measure on an IQ test or you can measure um, on a, a particular cognitive battery, things like attention and concentration, memory, numeracy, literacy, spatial reasoning, phonological awareness. We have good measures of all of these abilities and they do tend to positively relate to each other, forming something that we can call small i or um, uh, people have called it general intelligence, but I think it's really this kind of, um, a particular kind of intelligence. And I want to make very clear that I think intelligence you know, some researchers have the strategy of kind of sweeping intelligence under the rug. They'll say, oh, well, it's intelligence doesn't matter. It's really um, other characteristics. Well, instead of taking that approach, I say intelligence certainly matters, but not uh, the way we've been going around measuring it is really um, not getting the best out of students. So this is uh, one of the prototypical tests of small i intelligence. If you're good at this test, you're probably very good at, um, th at this kind of thinking. So in order to complete this pattern, you have to go across down and, um, and kind of complete the pattern. Part of getting this question right is knowing what is the question in the first place, you know? So people who are really good at small eye intelligence are very good at inference ability. They're really good at um, pattern solving. Does anyone want to answer this question? A little audience participation here? Yeah. Five, yeah, so, so very good. <laughs> You're very intelligent. Okay, so what you find is that this brain network, the executive retention brain network, has been studied over the past 40 years or so, 30, 40 years in the field of cognitive neuroscience, and it is very strongly correlated with that kind of reasoning. But this kind of big eye intelligence, this is what I want to talk about because it, it does encompass the small eye, but it actually goes way beyond that. So I define the kind of intelligence I think what really matters in our school system and what's really falling by the wayside, I define it as the dynamic interplay of engagement and ability in the pursuit of personal goals. I know it's a mouthful, but basically if I break it down a little bit, I would argue that at the very least, if we want to get the best out of students, we need to take into account not only their ability, sure we can measure their ability and ability does matter, but we also need to take into account what is their engagement levels. How engaged, how motivated are they in the curriculum? How much do they see a relevance to their own personal life? Those sorts of things. How, um, how much perseverance do they have for the task in particular? And then also what are their personal goals? So if we don't ask, you know, when we bring a students into an IQ testing session or, um, or to standardized testing session, there's very little um, questions on that test about their own personal goals, their own dreams, their own, their own dreams, their own desires, things of that nature. So we need to at the very least take into account all of these things. Now you can look at the standard metrics of human potential like IQ and try to predict um, someone's standardized test performance. This is actually a graph of, um, and, and you don't need to be a statistician to under, understand this graph. I'll kind of give you the takeaway message. It shows you the regression or the correlation of, I, of um, our standard, our most prominent measure of human potential in students and their actual achievement. And what you find is that 50% underperform 
based on their prediction. But what is hardly ever mentioned, and I wanted to do this analysis with my colleague Kevin McGrew to show this, is that 50% of students overperform what we expect out of them. And I think this is a really important point because it's very rarely mentioned when these kinds of statistics are, are shown. All those little dots, those are, those are living, breathing humans, you know? And, um, and, and each dot that doesn't conform to that regression line is an outlier. There are an awful lot of outliers there. So what I want to argue is that we leave a lot more room in our models, in our policies, and in our models for kids to surprise us, okay? I want to say that one more time. We need a lot of room for kids to outperform our predictions, our expectations of their success. I love this quote by uh, Joan Clark. Sometimes it is the people no one imagines anything of who do the things that no one can imagine. I absolutely love that quote. Um, e. Paul Torrance, the famous creativity researcher, did this longitudinal study to show what are the best predictors of lifelong creativity. And he found that IQ test performance, all these standard metrics of academic success, the correlations by the 10-year follow-up, 20-year follow-up, those correlations went down to zero. But the things that truly mattered, the things that outlasted 50 years later, they're still, Torrance is um, no longer alive, but they're still following these kids up 50 years later. They found that these set of beyonder characteristics are most predictive of lifelong creative achievement. So these are things such as love of work. How much do you actually love the process of working? And how much do we instill in students that love? Persistence, purpose in life, um, by the way, he found that these elementary school kids, it's not they had a, great, they had a fully fledged uh, purpose in life figured out, but they had the seeds of that purpose. And if we just take the time to get to understand the whole person, the whole, um, the whole student, we can actually start to see those seeds. And you see they are quite predictive over the years. Tolerance of mistakes, openness to change, risk taking. Feeling comfortable is a minority of one. He asked these elementary school kids, if you're in a classroom and you have a particular idea and nobody agrees with that idea, everybody thinks that idea is not valuable, are you comfortable being a minority of one in that classroom? The kids that said, yes, I'm, comf I'm okay with that, 50 years later, that was a better predictor than IQ of creative achievement, lifelong creative achievement. To me, it is incredible just how much prediction we can get if we actually interview, if we, not, I don't like the word interview, but if we actually get a chance to know um, many aspects of a person. See, these are all personal characteristics, and we don't get these personal characteristics out of our uh, predominant measures of potential that we currently have in the education system. Um, so out of all of these characteristics, Torrance found there was one that was most predictive of lifelong creativity. Does anyone want to guess? Does anyone just want to come out and guess? It's not on this list because I'm trying to be dramatic. So uh, what do you think was the number one predictor of lifelong creative achievement? If you know my title, at, um, at the, then you might be able to guess it. What is it? No. Who said that? Yeah, so she said imagination. It's a, a particular juxtaposition of passion, uh, right? It's passion and imagination. So he found that the kids who fell in love with a future image of themselves, that was a better predictor of lifelong creative achievement as well as personally meaningful. Not everything in life is about pleasing others, by the way. Not everything else in life is about publicly recognized achievement. He also looked at personally meaningful. A lot of the things that are the most personally meaningful to us are not the things that are gonna be the most publicly recognized. And I think we need to also take those predictors into account as well. So this is a quote from the, uh, the end of his, towards the end of his life. Life's most energizing and exciting moments occur in those split seconds when our struggling and searching are suddenly transformed into the dazzling aura of the profoundly new, an image of the future. One of the most powerful wellsprings of creative energy, outstanding accomplishment, and self-fulfillment seems to be falling in love with something, your dream, your image of the future. For the past 15 years, I've been um, studying the science of this, you know, what, how can we understand um, and get, the, get at the contents of our dreams, you know? How many times in your classroom, how many teachers are in this room? You know, your student, you, so you have a lesson plan and you have a goal, I need to get through this, I need to get through this, this, and you have a student who's daydreaming out the window. What do you do? Do you say, wait, hold up, my lesson plan is not nearly as important as the content of this kid's imagination. Everybody stop, hey, uh, John, or whatever your name is, uh, uh, Reem, <laughs> you know, what is, um, what are you thinking? What are your dreams? What, are you at, what would you actually like to accomplish in life? How much do we, do we actually ever stop to consider that maybe the contents of someone's dreams are just as, if not more important, than our set curriculum, right? So 
I've been studying this, and what I, we have found um, from a neuroscience perspective is that that brain network that is most t closely tied to um, IQ test performance, to standardized test performance, to the ability to focus on the teacher, is not what is most strongly correlated with our ability to imagine and to dream. And the, the main thing that Torrens found is the biggest predictor of lifelong creativity. The brain network that is most important is what's called the default mode brain network, which is a recent discovery in the field of cognitive neuroscience. And there's some really exciting work going on on this default mode network. They call it, the scientists call it the default mode network because it's what is at rest when we're just sitting there in, this, in the fMRI scan or we're just, when we're actually not, our attention is not being forced. It is our default. And what happens when our mind is default? Well, our mind tends to go towards the future. Our mind tends to think about our personally relevant goals. Um, it tends to, um, to think about um, and rehearse things that are unresolved, unresolved issues in our life, things that are very important. So I um, have renamed the default mode network the imagination network because I think it's a lot catchier <laughs> than, does anyone agree it's catchier than the default mode brain network? But you find these are the most important characteristics that are correlated with the uh, imagination brain network in recent years. So this is a summary of the last 20 years of cognitive neuroscience research linking certain processes to the, this brain network. And I would argue that every single one of these are falling by the wayside everywhere in the world. Every education system in the world, these set of skills are falling by the wayside. And it really is a use it or lose it sort of thing. We find in the brain that if we are not giving kids a chance to engage in these kinds of cognitive processes, they are literally um, not going to strengthen, we're robbing them of the opportunity to strengthen these skills. Daydreaming, imagining and planning their own personal future, retrieving deeply personal memories, making meaning out of the material, which is actually going to aid their long-term retention much better than any um, abstract, standardized sort of uh, memory is going to do. Monitoring your own emotional state. How much do we have kids um, uh, go inside, go inward, and really think about what am I feeling? What am I, um, how can I regulate those emotions? You know, before an exam, a lot of kids have test anxiety. And we find that it is not a negligible prediction between test anxiety and test performance. You know, and particularly around, among um, ethnic and minority students, you find that um, a lot of them, and females in particular fields, if they feel like they don't belong in the classroom, if they feel like um, that, that, that what they're about to show on that test is they, there's not high expectations, even kids in the special education classroom where they don't have high expectations, that is a predictor above and beyond their actual ability. Okay, so these things matter to really get and monitor your own emotional state. Reading fiction, um, research shows that if you just read abstract, scientific, technical kind of things, the executive attention network is very active. But if you have kids read and project their minds into the minds of others, you not only increase um, uh, perspective taking, you also increase compassion. Imagination is where compassion, is what fuels compassion. If you don't have imagination, Right, and let me phrase it this way. If you want to be compassionate about the suffering of someone else, you won't have that compassion unless you go inward and you make some sort of personal connection between what that person is going through and your own personal life. So I think imagination it gets very underrated when it comes to its role in compassion as well and, and bringing out peace in this world and perspective taking. And we've shown that this brain network, the imagination brain network, people who exercise these functions regularly and strengthen that brain network they show higher scores on something called openness to experience. How many of you have heard of this openness to experience? It is totally my favorite personality trait. I love the others, no offense, but if I had to pick one, it would be this one. And these are the kinds of characteristics that you find on a questionnaire um, would make you score high on openness to experience. So raise your hand if you would score about a four or five on any of these items, four or five being extremely high and high. I enjoy concentrating on a fa fantasy or daydream and exploring all its possibilities when it grow and develop. Okay, some of you. It's okay if you're not. I'm curious about many different things. Good. I like to reflect and play with ideas. I have an active imagination. Um, I have a deep appreciation for beauty. I get deeply immersed in music. I believe in the importance of personal growth. And this is really important. This one, you find all of these items correlate with each other, showing that they all are measuring the same different aspects of the same thing. And it, turn, it seems like people who are curious, daydream, show, um, also score high in personal growth. And I want to make very clear that personal growth is different than publicly recognized ambition. You find that's a different personality trait. That's grit. That's conscientiousness, which is also very, very important 
it's very important in interaction with openness to experience. If you have people who are just doers, then that's just duty. But if you have people who are dreamers and doers, that combination, I think that's the rule we really want is that sweet spot, that combination. People who are in it for the personal growth um, as well as making a public sort of big contribution to the world. And we found in our science, we looked at 10 different domains of creative achievement, visual arts, music, dance, architecture, creative writing, humor, inventions, scientific discovery, theater, film, culinary arts. And we find that you can actually measure people's different levels of achievement across various fields from I, you know, for the visual arts, I can't even do a stick man very well, to I have publicly recognized, um, made many contributions. And we've, we've looked at IQ, we have looked at um, the on-the-spot divergent thinking, we've looked at personality. We find openness to experience is the single best predictor. Um, this does confirm a lot of Torrance's work, but kind of under modern day scientific and neuroscientific um, sort of confirmation. So if Torrance is alive right now, I, I hope he'd be proud of this talk right now. Um, I hope he would also give a talk here at the World Government Summit. Um, and so you do find this is the single best uh, predictor out of, out of many um, other predictors that you could give. So at the Imagination Institute, where I work, where I run it with uh, Martin Seligman, who you uh, will all be hearing from uh, soon, giving his uh, main address. Um, we are dedicated to making progress in the measurement, growth, and improvement of imagination across all sectors of society. And one thing that we've done to kind of stimulate uh, the field um, and kind of move things forward is we want to come up with the new IQ, uh, IQ being imagination quotient. Instead, of, do you see what I did there? <laughs> Instead of intelligence quotient, right? So what are new ways, exciting ways that we could do to measure human potential, human possibility? I really do firmly believe that we're having way too many students fall by the wayside based on our current notions of what are the best predictors and then we can do a lot better in, um, in, in increasing that breadth and really picking up um, the personal aspects of a child, that sort of whole child sort of approach. So you can go on the Imagination Institute website, which is imagination-institute.org, and you can, um, you can read all these 16 projects that we've given uh, $3 million to researchers from all over the world to come up with new innovative ways from putting people in a virtual reality environment and having them try to come up with narrative stories to coming up with ways to hold teachers accountable for, their, for um, how much are they actually um, doing imagination in the classroom. I think at the teacher training level, from a policy perspective, I think it, a lot of it needs to operate at a teacher trainer level um, to increasing our understanding of the visual arts to little kids who might have a, a play or fantasy orientation. How much do we, how good are we really at getting at those kids who are um, the daydreamers, who are really fantasizing about um, imaginary worlds. There's some really interesting research showing that the kids who have really rich imaginary worlds, they are at higher proportion of MacArthur Genius Grant Fellows than the general population as well as the average college student. So we're missing out on a lot of things that are really important and I thank you all for having me here today.